I got started in service too. On a previous incarnation, I was a housewife in the suburbs of Birmingham with five children under the age of seven. It's uh, a board. I was very, two of my kids uh, were adopted, actually. They're still adopted. Everybody <laughs> in their 40s, we adopted uh, an American, a Native American from uh, Arizona, we adopted an African American from right here in Boston. Um, we were active in a, a family adoptive group called uh, Families for Interracial Adoption. And we were working with families who were thinking of adopting just like we had. Um, and they came to visit our house, a very modest house, and saw the kids together and they said, well, how do they get along? We say, uh, they fight all the time. <laughs> Just like regular kids. And we had, you know, people kept on adopting to these, adopting these kids, and then we ran out of Catholic parents. You might say, what do you mean you ran out of Catholic parents? There were two stupid uh, laws on the books that interfere, interfered with our work. Um, can you hear me? Uh, that interfered with our work. There was one law that said uh, children could only be placed in the home where the religion was the same as the natural parent mother, which drove me nuts having somebody else be the natural mother of my kid. And the second rule was uh, there were no birth control advice or devices that were given, this is 1968, before many of you were born. Um, said birth control advice and devices could not be given only to married people. So a uh, young girl who were uh, having sex, who wanted to have sex, would go to New York, or there were buses, going to New York to get birth control advice. And the people who were usually getting pregnant were Catholic girls. And um, uh, we couldn't find any more Catholic families, so I volunteered to be chairman of the legislative committee. And we started to go, and I talked with my own state rep, and he said, we can work to amend that law in some way. And we went to talk with Catholic Charities, which was the primary adoption agency in Massachusetts at that time, with a woman who said, there's only two people who decide which family gets which child. And she said, me and God. <laughs> I'm trying to deal with this lady. <laughs> anyway. Uh, we talked, I'm uh, not right to Carmen Bridget, we're not right to him, but he'd been undergoing a terrible scandal in the late 60s because a young Jewish family had adopted privately a, a girl, a child from a Catholic girl who changed her mind. And she went to court to get the kid back. And Carla Cushing uh, helped her. And they won. And they were going to take the kid away and they ran to Florida. And they raised that little girl, Hilary McCoy in Florida, and they tried to get extradition, and they couldn't get it. Um, but he looked terrible, and he was ready to compromise with us. So we worked with him, and we drafted a compromise that said, uh, a, 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 a mother out of Weimar who had signed a release with say that she didn't go, you know, where, uh, which religion the family had. And we brought another bill that said if a child had been in foster care for a year and a half and not been adopted, we could go to a family, another family. And um, we went up to the state house. Or I went up to the state house. Everybody else met in the district with their state rep and their state senator, and they said, did you know there were 2,000 kids stuck in foster care? And the rep said, had no idea. And for those of you who think policymakers really know what's going on, I got news for you. They don't. They find out when there are problems when a constituent comes and tells them. And they said, here's our family. And we were so cute, you know, brown children, white children, Asian children, phys you know, physically disabled kids. And we found out 200 reps and senators, 12 of them were adopted. 20 of them had adopted children. Another 50 of them uh, had a cousin or a next door neighbor or a nephew or a anybody who they knew about adoption and they thought it was terrible that 2,000 kids had been a, had, were stuck in foster care. And 
And so that film went through the hearings, went through the testimony, and I was sort of the coordinating lobbyist. But everybody worked with their own state rep and their own state senator in the district. That's what they care about, is their own constituents. And my job was to keep them in touch. That bill passed for the first year. Very easy. 2,000 kids were placed for adoption in the next six months. I still get goosebumps when I tell that story. And that's when I got addicted to power. <laughs> I said, that was fun. That was fun. And I ended up working for that governor, Sergeant, 1973. And he said, we want to do some, you're so good, find the parents who care about handicapped kids, because they're trying to reform special education. Find the kids who speak a family who are interested in kids who speak uh, English as a second language because we're trying to reform bilingual education. And I reached out to those parents who'd never been in the state house. I said, you don't have to come to the state house except once. Talk to your own step, rap in your own senator, and here's your talking point. We passed Chapter 766, which still stands as the primary special education program in the nation. We passed the bilingual reform legislation. And this was because this governor had hired me to say, organize the parents. That's where the that's where the power was. It was in the district and it was in the constituents going into their own rep and senator after doing some service as volunteers and saying, you gotta fix this. You know, um, government ought to be paying for this. And we won. And of course, we spent so much money that Michael Dukakis beat him. And I went to work for another uh, public official, Frank Malati, who was uh, Attorney General. And uh, I worked with him to do reach out to people. And uh, it was in the middle of what's the atomic power plant right over the North Shore? Seabrook. They're in the middle of organizing Seabrook. And some kids came in from Atlanta, and they said, we want the Attorney General to um, intervene in Seabrook. And they were the raggediest bunch of kids you've ever seen in your life. And I said, oh, that's interesting. I want you to go back. I want you to find a jacket. I want you to have a shirt. I don't want you to have a tie. But I want you to come in and tell them your, it's the issue and why you think you should intervene as Attorney General. And they said, okay. So they came in the next day, and there was a guy with them who was the man called Sam Lovejoy, who had torn down a uh, telephone company area and gotten arrested for it and protected himself. And this was civil disobedience, how big is it? And the attorney general told him, over. the next morning we met with eight guys from Northeast uh, Utilities with their five-piece suits on who talked down to the Attorney General and told him what his role is. And he said, F you, I'm in for getting in single. And he did. And I learned that let that public official come in to office after working with two of them with their own ideas about what they want to happen. And what happened is they get in there and special interest groups come into them and say, this is broken and we want you to fix it. And some of them hire lobbyists and get paid a lot of money. The lobbyists get paid a lot of money. And some of them don't. The parent advocacy group, the disabled advocacy group, the artist advocacy group, thanks to Kathy Pichetti, has grown like topsy in the last 40 years. There are more special interest groups that are going into reps and senators to say, this is broken in my community and I want you to have the power to fix it. And I want you to fix it. And if you can organize local groups from all over the state with the same message, you know what, they all talk to each other. And they have what I call an old shit moment. <laughs> so many people are talking about this, we're gonna have to do something about it. <laughs> and I decided to write a little book and do a little training program to teach 
ordinary people about how to do that. And that uh, material you've got in your desk will give you the website, which you can go into. And I'm going to give you a very quick, a very quick synopsis. Obviously, this is positive and productive relationships with your own state rep and your own state senator. And this is what we're talking about. Raise your hand. How many here, uh, member of your, you or a member of your family ever talked with an elected or appointed public official about anything? Raise your hand. Ooh, that's very good. Oh. Have any of you or a member of your family been involved in something called politics? Good, dirty word, especially in these days. I'm a, I, I introduce myself as a lobbyist in most places and people here. My mother never got quite used to me being a lobbyist. You know, she used to say, when are you going to get a real job? I say, Ma, it's a great job. It's one of the oldest professions in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and she was very religious. She was jumping from one kind of hospital to sex to another all the time. And I said, you know who the first lobbyist was, Ma? She said, no, who? And I said, Moses. Remember he came down from Mount Sinai? and said, well, I got it down to 10, <laughs> but adultery still in. <laughs> and she didn't think that was funny. <laughs> she didn't even think the old bumper sticker from Texas, don't tell my mother I'm a lobbyist, she thinks I'm a piano player in a whorehouse. <laughs> so, to survive, to survive, um, and to do good, to do justice, we have to be changing it. We just have to be. All of you doing service are going to find, why can't we do it this way instead of that way? And somebody's going to tell you it's a lock. And somebody's going to say, we're doing such a work, that orange line with, with, uh, with disabled kids. Why aren't we doing that to help kids move around the city? Well, the government isn't supporting it, and we don't have the money to pay for it. So why isn't the government, government supporting it? So the thing is, never doubt a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has Margaret Mead. I've got that <coughs> over my desk. That is not Margaret Mead. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody know who it is? No, but that's another tip. This is Diane Jack Eiker, who uh, again, in the late 50s, in her early 60s, built two health centers, one in Mississippi and one up here in, uh, in Roxbury. It's now called the Guy Gibson Health Center. And they were free health care for poor people. Nobody had ever done anything like this before. He was in the district of a guy named uh, Tom O'Neill, who was Speaker of the House. And the Tom O'Neill Speaker of the House came and said, damn, this is a good idea. We ought to figure out how to do this, and I know who can do it. And he took a bike plane and paid for it and introduced him to Lyndon Johnson, who was writing up all the stuff for the war on poverty. So included in that war on poverty, which is being desecrated by the Republicans today, was health centers, and there are thousands of them across the state. Legal services, um, Head Start, uh, community health centers, and a whole bunch of good stuff. And that was, that was, Jack Geiger building a model of how things work. And that little exhibit, of the orange lines around shows that the model works. Here's something you can do. Here's a picture of part of the And we all, if we want to be change agents, have to do it consciously. You know, I show this to people, uh, older white people, and I say, how many people here think that Rosa Parks was really a maid who was tired and got on the bus and sat down and I'm not going to ask you to do it here. People raise their hands. Rosa Parks was an agent. She had been auditioned for that job. She'd gone to training programs about that job. She did not get on that bus alone. She had lawyers. She had photographers. And that's how they got that picture. She was a constant agent for change that said, we need somebody to do something that will attract the attention of the nation. And she did the Birmingham bus boycott, 368 days later, finally opened up their buses to buy. Uh, what's policy 
anyway, I'm not going to ask you all ask for two seconds. What's policy? Don't look at the paper. Policy, 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 fun. No answers. It's a rule made up and enforced by people in authority to control the behaviors of other people in their family. Okay, I had a mother, a mother of five children, I had some family policy. One of them was, you had to eat a bite of everything on your plate before you got dessert. So, you know, the boys would come and go, what's for dessert? When they decided they were going to eat anything. What are some of the worst policies any of you, as you were growing up, ate them? Come on, bedtime? <coughs> Computer time? No I policies? You were all to go out. What? How did you wear a dress to go out for dinner? <laughs> there you go. I was not allowed to wear makeup until I was 14. So guess what I put on where I put my makeup on when I was 12? <laughs> on the school bus. You know, you make policy and you do your best. But <laughs> families make policy. Uh, how many here have children? Raise your hand. Great think of. How many of you are the person that made policy in your family? You know, usually the men's hands drop like stones. <laughs> you know, men are relegated to, I don't know, ask your mother. There is workplace policy that's made by managers, it's made by executive directors, it's made by the board. I, I had hospital policy here since the last time I did it, and I had a president. Uh, Boston Children's Hospital there, and I said, Dr. whatever his name is, Mandel, what's the policy for getting this laptop and renting this room? He said, I have no idea. Who made that policy? There's somebody in charge of IT there who makes that policy. And there is city, state, or county, or public policy. Um, this is the generic policy-making process for children, for families, for workplaces. You have to know there's a problem and then you analyze the options for change. I'm the board of a community health center, and I tried to push the policy that we shouldn't have any more uh, machines that had soda and candy in them. You know, 12 months later, was that policy, you know, we could not get that policy made or implemented because guess who stood in the way? The what? Soda company? Yeah, they argued we made money. It was the providers, it was the doctors and the nurses. They wanted that four o'clock caffeine not. You know, so now they, you know, go we got healthy stuff and all the all the all the vending machines. You go to any of the doctors or nurses' office, you pull out the drawer and just the find candy. So we had long discussions about how much money we were gonna lose. We chose the most effective option and now we're action and implementing. You know, we don't let the doctors and nurses have a bowl of candy on their desk to give to the patients or to get that early heart. But there's this whole thing now about healthy foods. Uh, what's politics? None. What? Yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, and Hannah Arnett, famous philosopher, said that politics was the specific alternative to war. Think about that. It is the process people in authority use to make policy and decide who gets what, where, and when without resorting to physical violence. You drop your kid off the daycare and you say, share, honey, you know, and I hope they'll share without backing somebody's other kid's head with a car. But that's what politics is. They've written whole books about it. The process people use. We had a family council in my house when the kids were, uh, I think Nancy was 11 and June was 10 and Jackie yeah, was 3. And we had a family council, we were so different, we talked about family policies, like eating every vegetable at bedtime, whether you could go to the park by yourself, how old. Uh, my son, who was 10 at the time, came and said, Ma, I want to catch them. Now, of course, we had a policy in my house, no so. And he said, now I want a family council. And I went, okay. 
I can tell you about the process in my house for the family council. The kids each had one vote, I had three, and their father had three. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw Jim that afternoon going around talking to everybody and giving his little brother, three year old brother a quarter. <laughs> and I said, God, he's doing good. Isn't he doing good? But, you know, I got the votes. And so we had family council after supper, and Jim made a little presentation. I got the money. He showed us the money. He said, I'll never point it at anybody. Yeah, right. But da 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 da. And his sisters uh, uh, supported him. And then it brought to a vote. My husband said, Honey, you can just pick up a stick and go bang, bang. What's the difference? And he voted for the stick. <laughs> So Chip has them. And we never had another family council. <laughs> and this is what leadership's all about. <laughs> In a decision-making body, speakers of the House, presidents of the Senate, do not take an issue to the floor before they know where the votes are. And I had not done my homework. Many, many years later, the same boy who was now would be just diagnosed with his attention deficit, hyperactive, whatever it is, barely got through high school. Finally got um, into the, appointed to the, um, scored 100 on the police exam, and fought, then went to the police uh, academy, and he won everything, first in this, first in that, and he had this great big trophy, and he's getting congratulated by the mayor, and he looked down at me, and went. <laughs> He had a gun. <laughs> he finally had a gun, and furthermore, I paid for it. <laughs> so that's, um, sometimes people in authority look at the information about a problem and talk to other people before they decide. Sometimes they decide all by themselves. That was a question in my health center. That was a question in my family council. You know, we had a discussion. But sometimes mothers don't. Get out of the street. Why? Because I said so. That's why. You know, can I have a tattoo um, on my nipple? No, you can. Why not? Hey, um, maybe. Because, you know, because I said so. It doesn't, you know, make sense all the time. <laughs> Generic policy influencing process. For those of you who want to influence public policy makers, you have to define a sympathetic and compelling in, uh, problem. You have to be able to talk about your problem in a way that's like, a, do you know 2,000 kids are stuck in foster care? Do you know that all these, um, this wonderful program for disabled kids and uh, artists is fall, I made that up, is falling apart in our town? He said, I don't know. You know, we have to define it in a way that they have, what I've already referred to, is an old shit moment. I'm going to have to do something about it. And then you develop solutions. You can't go in and just say it's a problem. You can't go in and say do something. <coughs> you have to come in with a specific solution. This little program for the youth in the disabled unit costs uh, $100,000. And you have to appropriate it in the supplemental budget. And this is when the supplemental budget's coming up. So you have to be able to give them a solution so that they can say, Okay, I know there's a problem, I understand it, I know how much it costs, and I'm going to help do it. Uh, here's the administration of Massachusetts. You know what the governor's name is, right? Everybody? DeWall Patrick? All right, he's got a legal counsel, he's got this very important person who manages money, he's got 14 different secretaries. This is what they do in the administration, it's in your handout. They, develop regulations, create initiatives, make appointments. Sometimes they appoint good people, sometimes they appoint complete idiots. But you still have to deal with that. Rule making process, they make rules up all the time. Here's the Massachusetts legislature. The Speaker of the House, anybody? Cilio, <coughs> good. Bobby Cilio from Winthrop. I don't know how much art is going on in Winthrop. I do know something. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. Now, does Bobby DeLeo know what's going on? Yes, he does. Good. Somebody's been in to tell him here, Mass Cultural Council, right? Yes. 
Uh, here's what's going on in your community in Winthrop around art and theater and dancing. And here's why it's important to keep funding. He would have no idea if somebody didn't come in and talk. And the center president is Therese Murray. Therese Murray, all you guys. Good. From Okay, two things. Terry Murray grew up poor in Dorchester. She's divorced. She has a grown child named Lauren, who's 23 or 24, who's an artist. <laughs> Bobby DeLeo from Winthrop has two grown children. One's a daughter. One's a son who is developmentally disabled. I don't know of any direct linkage to art, but if I was going to lobby him, I would find him. Uh, policy making, they pass a new law, pass an old law, repeal an old law, create a special study commission, appropriate money. This is how a bill becomes law. There's no getting around it. You have to file a bill, you have a committee hearing. There are people here who have been in committee hearings, right? Have to talk to them here, right? There's hearings happening all the time up in the State House um, about all kinds of things. Then a bill has to get through the committee hearing, then go to the budget committee, go to the House floor for debate go over to the Senate, Senate floor for debate, and then has to be signed by the governor. A lot of steps, but they're all baby steps. There's not a single giant step in there. There are people to talk to. Here's the budget timetable. We are in June. And um, we now have a conference committee uh, right over the governor's desk that are looking at the two budgets from the House and the Senate and are then it's sent it to the governor's office until we go some steps. Here's the first rule of influencing public and private policy makers. They make different decisions when watched by the affected constituency. They make most of their decisions without having the remotest idea how it affects their local constituents. And number one is constituents. <coughs> number one is constituents. Why do they care about constituents? No, we vote them in office. Yeah. <laughs> they want to get reelected. This is fun. They're elected. They're an, an addicted to power, just like I am. <laughs> this is fun. I can really make a difference in people's lives. Just give me an opportunity. Just tell me what you want me to do, and I'll try to do it. You might not agree with them all the time, but second rule is is you have to get the right information, a compelling problem, an effective solution to the right person at the right time before they have to vote. And rule three is the toughest one. Elected and appointed officials making policy decisions always weigh opinion as equal to fact. You've got somebody who's a state rep or a state senator who has artists in their family trying to make a living. They have a different opinion about funding artists than people who don't have any money. It's a fact. It's their experience informs them, their values inform them. A sympathetic, compelling problem and a strategic, effective solution is a hero opportunity. A hero opportunity is a compelling progress of crisis that gives them an opportunity to make a critical difference in the lives of a critical mass of constituents. Not everybody. A critical, opinionated, a group of people who have a voice and who, who will be making them accountable. Message number one is values matter. We all reason from deeply held values, all of us. It helps the legislators uh, answer, why does this matter to me? And you'll be surprised. You start systematically going to your own rep and senator to find out their connections to art and culture. And we need to start with values, not with the policy and program details. Most people go in and say, I'm here for Canada, for SHIP. I'm in here to reduce bycatch, which is fishermen are up there doing that now. And I'm here for artists in context, but you will have the missing T in artists in context. And they'll go, artists in context? What's that? What's that? I have no idea. You might go in for the cultural council, and maybe because of the good work that's already done, they'll know what it is. And the second stuff, we go in for level two, which is movements, 
which is workforce development, the environment, adult education, arts and culture. But the most important value to come in on are big values like justice, opportunity for all, strong family, common good, quality of life, prosperity. Those are the things that count. Here's some other things that are around that are shared values. I do this up in New Hampshire, and guess what their big value is? Live free or die. Uh -huh. Here's a little example. Uh, we helped some people talk about expanding um, immunizations to folks. Every child should have, that's why we're proposing a new agency rule requiring, which wasn't getting anywhere, but a better beginning was the health of the whole community is protected when we ensure that our children are immunized. One of the ways we do this is through our public health agencies, blah, blah, blah. It's just a whole different way of talking about it in terms of values. Uh, there is an all-purpose fill-in-the-blanks rap diet asking anybody for anything. If we had our regular three-hour training, I would be working with you in small groups to help you fill in the blanks on that. Uh, which is, I know you agree that something's in crisis, we care because it's what we did in our doctor's care. We know something would begin to fix it, and you can help by doing something. Here are some pet potential heroes for you in the Massachusetts legislature. Uh, Sonia Chang Diaz, from, anybody, anybody here from JP, you know they've got Sonia? One, two, three, four, five, top five, that's good. Anybody here from Pro Provincetown, we've got Sarah. Mm -hmm. uh, Linda Dorcia Forey from Mattapan. Nope. Uh, Eileen Donahue from Lowell. Anybody want to tell me why I put those pictures up there? Women. <laughs> That is a joint committee of the legislature called Tourism, Arts, and Cultural Development. They have hearings on anything that has to do with art and culture. They have them two or three times a week. Sarah Peake is the chair from Provincetown. Get to know her. I talked with somebody today. Who's that? Tell me about Sarah. <coughs> She's made, her partner is an artist? Yes. Yeah. She's a lawyer, that's all right. She's an ex-lawyer. Ex-lawyer. <laughs> or as one of my friends said, a recovering lawyer. <laughs> she, um, she and her partner run a bed and breakfast. So she got into this because she was very concerned about tourism in Provincetown. Good. She's the arts and cultural piece sideways, but she's a strong That's all right. You've, you've found some way. you found some way to talk to her. And Eileen Donahue is the Senate <coughs> Chair from Lowell. Brand new freshman. She was a city councilor for many years. A very wonderful woman. I don't know anything of where she is in art. She likes the art. She works very close with the artists in Lowell. Uh, a lot going on up there. Yeah, oh, she's great. Good. Um, here's a real help model for a winning campaign, which is a hero opportunity message. Uh, operational coalition with enough resources for a skilled, savvy staff. I would suggest you have one here in Artists for Context and an advocacy team. You can only win if we're organized. People think you just buy a lawyer, buy an operator. No, you need staff and board and friends and family. There's something about here about religious coalition. Here's the all purpose script for contact with policymakers. We are constituents. I don't know that customer said. We serve your constituents. So it's not only we are your constituents, but we are working with an agency that serves your constituents. We're part of an advocacy team. We know the facts about the issue. We have an answer. We want an answer, and you have a hero opportunity to look good to this constituent group. What if you get a technical question? Someone will be back to you soon with detailed answers. Thank you. What if you get a question, I can't support you? You say, we'll be very disappointed. <laughs> Thank you for being candid. Kathy will tell you that's a, one of the best answers you can get. They hang you up and hang up. They finally tell you you can't vote for this appropriation. You almost want to give them a kiss because they told you the truth. And then you know you'll get them the next time. Here's some lobbying facts. The First Amendment includes the right to lobby. If any of you work for a nonprofit and they tell you you can't lobby, you can't lobby, tell them to get another lawyer. 
It's part of the First Amendment. They can't. Their lobbying is restricted because they can't lobby if it's more there, and that's it. It's <laughs>
and the press is going to be there, and we're going to have the press there. And we have a monthly newsletter, and we'll have a picture of you and your little announcement in the monthly newsletter. And then they'll come. Why do they want earlobe opportunities? They don't, you know, you read the papers, there's no good things about state rep being said in the paper. Today there's even a story about a freshman rep from Braintree who had the bad judgment to have sex with a young aide in the speaker's chair during a late night session at 4 a.m. <laughs> so the, the speaker's having an investigation. You know, and I'm thinking it's 4 a.m., they're in recess. These are two unmarried consenting, <coughs> consenting adults. Uh, I mean, really. Uh, but there's nothing good about elected officials in the papers lately. <laughs> so anything you can do to make them look good in their community by supporting arts and culture is a win. artists who've gone in, who've met with that legislator, who've met with the aide, and they go, ooh, there's something up here about the cultural council. I'm going to call our friends, the artists locally, make sure how we should vote. You want to create a presence for artists in this.